All right, that was the countries that takes care of that. All right, it's a very simple, it's a very simple lesson, a very simple discussion that we have. Um, put up that first slide, will you? Okay, you're familiar with this word if you've been here for any length of time. Baruch, baruch, bless. I don't know if people understand though, it's kind of twofold. It means one, to salute or to kneel as an act of adoration. Two, it means to be blessed, which is the impartation of protection, prosperity, and peace. So basically, to salute or kneel, oh boy, <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> what, what, what power are these? One seven, that's not bad, yeah. Okay, Mars, I just see Mars, not Venus with Charlie's. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so, so the first one, to salute or kneel. A lot of you, how many, how many military, ex-military? You know the salute. You know. I still salute people. If I meet people, they, I know I have a general friend. Gen he's general. He'll always be a general. Lieutenant colonel. Colonel. They'll always be. Always be in my, in my mind. So to salute or kneel before the Lord is an act of worship. You're not doing that in the military. You're showing respect, but it's worship. It's regarding God with the utmost esteem, love, and respect. When you say bless the Lord, that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying, or that's what you should be saying. Now, the second part, the impartation of protection, prosperity, and peace, is a transmission of physical, mental, and spiritual wellness to one. So therefore, what I'm saying, when you use the word baruch in the Hebrew language, which is so prevalent, it's the part of every single Hebrew prayer, you can either bless the Lord or be blessed by the Lord. Okay, it's twofold. You can bless the Lord, baruch, or you can be baruch, be blessed by the Lord. This week we're going to go over blessing the Lord, and next week we're going to go over what it means to be blessed by the Lord. Fair? Okay. Look at Psalm 95.6, just to give you an idea. This is only one verse of many. It says, come, let's bow down and worship, let's kneel. That word is bruch. Let's kneel before the Lord who made us. This is what we do when we bless the Lord. We bow down in homage, we're worshiping. We're worshiping God. Now, I think, my personal opinion, that we did ourselves a great disservice in the Christian community by allowing, and I say allowing, the enemy to remove the Judeo aspect of Judeo-Christianity. If you look in the book of Acts, it was not removed. It started to be removed after Acts. And by 95 AD, there wasn't one Jewish bishop that was invited to any of the meetings thereafter. It was history by then. Why did Satan want to vacuum the Judeo part out of the Judeo-Christianity? Because the wall had come down and the Jew and Gentile were one. He's got to rebuild the wall. And how do you rebuild the wall? What are you guys doing, you crazy Gentiles worshiping on Saturday? Uh-uh, we're going to have a new day. We're going to call it Sunday. And we're going to implement that. And it became the law by 325, way before there was Catholicism, by the way. People think that was a Catholic thing. No, it wasn't a Catholic thing. It was a satanic thing. So they went, you Gentiles, you're Sunday. You Jews, you still Saturday. Keep the Sabbath. You Gentiles, eat whatever you want. You Jews, mm -mm, there's certain things you can eat, certain things you can't eat. You Gentiles, you focus on Christmas and Easter. You Jews, focus on Passover and Sukkot. And you see the change? Brick by brick by brick. And now what do you have? You have a giant wall between Jews and Christians. Why did God resurrect the movement? The Messianic movement is not new. It's renewed. There's no such thing as a new moon. When you go, oh, look, a new moon, you don't say, look, a, a new moon is in brand new. It's a renewed moon. The moon. It's the same old moon. So why did God resurrect the Messianic movement? In his infinite wisdom, he resurrected it to bring the wall down again. Because he's getting ready to send his son back, and his son can't come back for two brides. And the word promises us that Israel will be saved. 
So she's going to be saved. It's going to happen. How's it going to happen? By the arm of the Lord. There's no gimmick. We, we tried. In the Messianic movement, in the MJ, we've tried everything you could possibly do to win Jews to the fold. You name it, we did it. And then we gave up, which is what God wanted us to do in the first place. He goes, I got this. It's going to happen. But I'm going to do it. And guess who's going to get the glory? Of course. But in the meantime, we have to keep breaking down this wall, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Okay, God's not a bigamist, only one bride. There's only one believer. There's no denominations. They don't exist. Only on earth. Man's plans. Exactly. God is restoring what the locusts have devoured. He is restoring it. You, don't you see it? Why do you think there's 78 nations that are watching? And he's restoring it all over the world. I'm here to tell you, Messianic Judaism is so prevalent all over the world. You know why? Because in America, we're smart. We have PhDs. We're intellects. We have higher education. And that intellect gets in the way of the truth. And we're so smart. How could we be wrong? We can't be wrong. We've been doing this for 1,100 years. And you've been doing it wrong for 1,100 years. Just because you're doing something wrong for a long time doesn't make it right. Hitler said if you tell a big enough lie for a long enough period of time, it becomes the truth. But when you go to Africa, see, they're stupid, right? They're not educated like we are. So if they read something in the Bible, they believe it. Be an idiot. Believe what you're reading. Stop jerking around. Well, I know this is right, but this is not the way we do it. Who, who's we? Oh, Rabbi, we've been doing this since. Who cares? Who cares? I thought Yeshua had nothing to do with me. You know what I had to give up? Do you know what my mother said to me? When, when I told her about Jesus, she said, Gregory, your father, he's turning in his grave. Don't do that to your father. And thankfully, she still stayed with me because sometimes the garment is rent. And you're done. You're dead. So don't tell me about what you have to give up. We can glean so much from the people who wrote two-thirds of the Bible. In fact, all the authors of the Bible were Jewish. But you have two-thirds of the Bible that's called the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. One area from Jewish life that this is so true is in the realm of blessing blessing there are many blessings guys in traditional judaism and you know i don't really talk like this it's very rare that i talk about traditional judaism it's very rare that i hound you with any of it but today's a different day there's a large number of jewish blessings that revolve around food and you might go <laughs> it's all about food right no it's not all about food so why is this so why does so many blessings revolve around food in judaism it's because the rabbis believed According to the Talmud, Baruchut 35 AB, if you ever want to look it up, they believe that eating food without first blessing God was a form of stealing. Since blessing is the only payment God demands for the food he provides man. If you knew the depth of your roots, as opposed to these crazy Gentiles running around telling you to walk to synagogue and put on tzitzits, if you really understood the depth of the intimacy that God wants to have with you and that you can have with God, it's a game changer. It's so much more than rules or tenets or three principles or three-part sermons. Whoever invented that? Who said there could be only three points? And who said you got a rhyme? What are you, Mother Goose? Blessing set over food or anything else starts with the same formula. Let me show you. It starts, Baruch Ato Adonai, Eloheinu. And you, you know, you, you don't have to read the phonetics. You can learn, you can actually learn Hebrew, you know. But this is Baruch. This thing is, probably needs a new battery or it needs a new. Hey, Roxanne, where are you? Where? Get me one of these this week, will you? Get me a good one too. Don't chance out. Baruch Ata Adonai, Yud He Vav He. By the way, for all you guys that a secret sacred name is and saying Yahweh, where do you get off saying that? You don't know the vowels. 
The whole idea of the tetrachromatron was you're not supposed to know. Are you guys saying, yeah, yeah? What are you, from the Netherlands? Just leave it alone. Stop it. Okay? Don't worry about how to pronounce the name. Worry about your intimacy with the name. So you see, you'd hey, vav, hey, it's not supposed to be pronounced, right? Why do you think in Judaism they call it Hashem? Right? Hashem. There's no pronunciation for this. The vowels were put in by the rabbis. So they go, Yehovah. There's no vowels in the original Hebrew. So you don't know. You're not supposed to know. Because the minute you name something, you limit it. God is limitless. Eloheinu melech olam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. That's how every prayer starts. The Lord's prayer kind of starts like that, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Before you start saying anything, declare the greatness of God. Don't ask for nothing. He knows what you need. Don't start like that. And if you don't feel it, don't say it because he knows. Don't manipulate him. Don't flatter God. And don't flatter yourself by flattering God in front of people. Either it's real or it's not. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You are king. You are king. Avenu Malchenu, our father and our king. You're king. You're king over all. The most well-known blessing over food, I'm sure if you've been celebrating Shabbat, is the what? Exactly. The Hamotzi. You nailed it. You all right? You sleeping? You guys celebrate Shabbat every week. Don't you say the hamotzi over the bread? So what are you looking at? Like you're painting. Um, let's put the hamotzi up there. Okay. Baruch atah Adonai Oheinu Melchalam. That's how it starts every prayer. Every single prayer. And then hamotzi lechem min ha'oretz. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And we say, Hamotzi lechem in anorets, Hamotzi lechem hashemayim b'shem Yeshua m'shecheinu, Halechem chachayim. So we say, who brings forth bread from the earth, who also brings forth the bread of heaven, the bread of life, Yeshua. We add that because we're not totally traditional. We're Messianic Jews. I believe in the Messiah. The believing community definitely follows suit, right? Don't they follow suit, Christians? Don't they always pray over their meal? Let me tell you where you guys go wrong. You talk too much. What are you doing? You're thanking God for the food. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And you're sitting there at the restaurant, and you're like preaching a sermon. I watch. And the guy with the food is standing there. Everything's getting moldy and cold. And, oh, Lord, give us revelation and... Give us deliverance from our woes. And God's saying, I thought you were going to thank me for the food. <laughs> and you know the lady that's sitting next to and help my cousin, she's so miserable, deliver her from... <laughs> and Father, save the busboy who's been holding the food for the last hour. <laughs> that heathen... I don't even want to touch in my food. It's too long. And is this my opinion? No, it's Yeshua's. Matthew 6, 7, read it. It's too long. Thank Him for the food and start eating. <laughs> Many blessings currently recited in the Jewish world were formulated 2,000 years ago. I'm just giving you a little history lesson. During the time when Judea was under Roman rule, right? The first century. The blessing's emphasis on God's responsibility for all of creation may have been, and I say may have been because I don't know, helped inspire ancient Jews not to be overawed by Rome's technological and military might. It was very impressive. A lot of us are impressed. We're impressed by people. We're impressed by athletes. We're impressed by money. We're impressed by things. We're impressed by cars. We're impressed by intelligence. We're impressed by prowess. And so you've got to keep praying so that you don't get too impressed with it and stay impressed with God. Do you understand? There was a reason behind these prayers. The rabbis got together and there was a reason. Also, it was a, a time when many Jews might have felt abandoned by God. They were being knocked around. They were slaves, basically. So they had to keep praying. Why? To remind themselves, God is still with us. God did not leave us. We might not be delivered today. Come on, how many of you? 
Where are you, God? Stop it. He hasn't left. He hasn't left. It's timing. We pray, God, change our circumstances. Do you ever think that maybe God's using your circumstances to change you? They reminded the Jews several times a day. How many times did they eat? God is still with us. 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 God. You've got to train yourself. You've got to speak it. In the modern world, today, 2,000 years later, the blessings play a very similar function. It reminds us throughout the day that God cares and provides for us. There's a great Polish-born rabbi. Uh, he was born in 1907. He died in 1972. Abraham Joshua Heschel. He was probably the leading Jewish theologian of the 20th century. And, by the way, he was a leader in the civil rights movement. Look, to my African-American brothers and sisters, thank God I wasn't raised. I just wasn't raised to, to look at color. My mother wouldn't allow it. You've got to understand she was an Orthodox Jew. You don't know about Orthodox Judaism. Orthodox Jews are hammered, hammered with the scripture from Exodus. You were once an alien in Egypt. Don't treat anybody like an alien. So I say things and you go, how do I get away with it? Easy, I'm not prejudiced. A lot of you can't get away with it. Because when you say it, it's just not right. You know what I mean? But listen to me, you have to know your history. It was, it was the Jewish attorneys that came from the tri-state area we thought it was disgusting what happened down here in the South. And we knew because we were slaves for 400 years. And the Lord prompted us to come down here. The, the, the poor black people weren't educated. You, you, without education, how can you afford an attorney? So we came from Connecticut and New Jersey and New York and we fought pro bono. We fought. I'll show you a, let me show you a picture, okay? Okay, this is the march from Selma in 1965, March 21st. Do you remember that march? From Selma to Montgomery, to the courtroom stairs, okay? There's Dr. King. There's Rabbi Heschel. Dr. King called him a true prophet. You don't know your history. So what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened. I told Dr. King's son what happened. After his father was shot, I met with him after his father was shot. I'm not trying to be a big shot. The people that took over the movement were more militant. And Jews weren't Jews anymore. They were just white people. Guys, you've got to get off of this. Black, white, rabbi, you don't understand. I do understand. Nobody's been more persecuted than the Jewish people. Please, save it. I'm not telling you you have to get over it. I'm telling you as a believer, you've got to have a different spirit. You just must. You can't judge a book by its cover or the first 250 pages. You can't group a whole people because you met a few that rubbed you the wrong way. And you don't know what that person is going through when you met them. How do you know if the lady's miserable? She just didn't get a text from her husband, I'm leaving you. Or she didn't just get a call from the hospital, your son has leukemia. You got to... Let me tell you what Heschel wrote. It was a beautiful quote, okay, regarding blessing. He said, even when we drink a glass of water, we remind ourselves of the eternal mystery of creation. The Orthodox Jew, when they drink a glass of water, when they have a fruit, when they wake up in the morning, they pray. They pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, whose word all things came into being. A trivial act and a reference to the supreme miracle. Wishing to eat bread or fruit to enjoy a pleasant fragrance or a cup of wine on tasting fruit in season for the first time, on seeing a rainbow or the ocean or noticing trees when they blossom, on meeting a sage in Torah or in secular learning, on hearing good or bad tidings, we are taught to invoke God's great name and our awareness of him. That's what happens when you pray. You become more aware of the greatness of God. Even on performing a physiological function. Do you know there's a prayer for when you urinate? I don't know if any of you ever had trouble, urologically speaking. I have from surgeries. It's not fun when you can't urinate. You learn the hard way that it's a beautiful thing. It's a gift from God. Blessed are you who heals all flesh and does wonders. This is one of the goals of the Jewish way of living. Now, do Jews still believe this? 
No. Maybe 10% at best. Maybe. This is one of the goals of the Jewish way of living, to feel the hidden love and wisdom of God in all things. This is the objective for the believer. This is the objective for us, to feel the hidden love and wisdom of God in all things. To sense Him everywhere and in everything. It's magnificent. Another very well-known prayer of blessing is called the Kaddish. Anybody familiar with it? It's more than 2,000 years old. See, the rabbis got together. What were they trying to do? They're trying to do what you're trying to do with your kids. You're trying to keep them close to God. They were like parenting the community. They were like, how do we keep the people close to God? You know, they're starting to get secular. They're starting to pull away. They're starting to get into this and that. Like our kids. So they developed ways. They weren't manipulative. They were like worried. They were concerned. The Kaddish is beautiful. It's recited in almost all prayer services. Although it is recited in memory of the dead, the prayer itself says nothing about death. Its theme is the greatness of God, reflected in the opening words, and it's Yitkadal v'yitkadashimei rabah v'yama divarachu rutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayichon uv'yamichon uv'chayichon v'yamichon Yisrael. Rabbi, can you read Hebrew? What are you, nuts? I just did. Go to the English for a minute. This is said, this is said in memory of the dead. We say it once a year for our parents, children, sadly enough. But then when they die, we say it, if you're Orthodox, you have to go to the synagogue every morning. When I was 15 years old, I had to go wrap to fill in every morning for 11 months. Try that with your kids. You can't get them here once a week. Every day for 11 months. And this is what I said. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world. What does this have to do with my father passing? Which he has created according to his will. Okay. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel even swiftly and soon and say amen. Okay. Where's, where's my dad in this? Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is He, though He be high above all the blessings, songs, praises, and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say, Amen. May He who makes peace in His high places make peace upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. That's weird for a mourner's prayer, no? I don't blame you for wondering, what is that all about? Why is this recited in memory of the dead? Because Jewish people felt that the finest way to memorialize the dead was to recite the Kaddish, thereby testifying that the deceased person left behind worthy descendants. All my mother wanted me to do was be a Jewish boy and to honor the God of Israel. So every morning for 11 months, I was honoring the God of Israel. Was it forced? It's kind of beautiful hanging out with nine or ten octogenarian Jews who showed up in the basement of this little synagogue and rapping to fill in and honoring my father. In the case of the death of a sibling, a child, or a spouse, Kaddish is recited for one month. When a parent dies, it's 11 months. Even though the mourning period is 12 months. One of the best known Jewish blessings, also my favorite, is the Shechechiano. Take a look. It's real brief. This is beautiful to say this. This is beautiful to say this on Shabbat. You're saying, blessed are you, O Lord our God. You are king of the universe. You kept us alive. Not us. You did. You have sustained us. And you have brought us to this very season. It's recited when tasting a fruit for the first time in season. When moving into a new house, putting on new clothes, at the beginning of every one of the Lord's feasts, and on many other happy occasions. It's omitted at a circumcision. Why? Because of the infant's pain. Isn't that sweet? They thought of everything. Even first thing in the morning, we're supposed to offer up a prayer of thanks. We're supposed to say, when we rise, I give thanks unto you, Adonai, that in mercy you have restored my soul within me. Endless is your compassion. Great is your faithfulness. I thank you, Adonai, for the rest you have given me through the night and for the breath that renews my body and spirit. How many wake up like that? Instead of, uh, 
I had such a bad night's sleep. You have a mattress. Be thankful. I need coffee. I got to check my phone before I get out of bed. What are you checking your phone for? You're not that important. Now let's look at some verses in the Bible because although the Jews, a lot of them missed Messiah, I think a lot of Christians missed blessing the Lord. Look at Psalm 34.1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. How about thanksgiving for the new birth? How about that? Rabbi, it's just things aren't going my way. You saved? You can't thank him every day for that? Salvation from sin is a gift of such tremendous value that it should draw endless thanks from our hearts to the giver of life. If we were to bless the Lord at all times, it could hardly be too much. There's nobody in here that's going to ever say, ease up, too much blessing. God's not going to say that. If his praise were to be continually on our lips, we couldn't exhaust the subject. No human tongue will ever be able to thank God adequately throughout all eternity. I try so hard and I fail so miserably. Thankfully, God knows my heart. Psalm 103.1, we read it this morning. Bless the Lord, my soul, everything in me, bless his holy name. One of the reasons I think we love the Psalms, at least why I love the Psalms, is they verbalize so beautifully what we often feel but cannot find words to express. The Psalms do it. They speak for us. Nowhere is this truer than in the 103rd. Here we call on our soul, that non-material part, our spirit, our soul, our body, to bless his holy name. And then 103.2, again, again, it feels so right that we got to have it a second time with the added reminder, none of his benefits for all he does. We forget, we forget, we forget. What about soundness of body? Soundness of mind? What about sight? What about hearing? What about, Rabbi, come on, I take it for granted. A lot of people here, oh yeah? Go to the school of the deaf. Go to the deaf home. I go, go in Macon. See, see how those kids have been discarded. They can't see, they can't hear. They have multiple, they were just tossed. Tossed. Like, like rubbish. Psalm 103, 20, 22, you read it. David steps up to the microphone. He's blown away. And in the midst of this crescendo, this crescendo, this anthem of praise, he's like, he's so enraptured, he's like, what about me? You know, all the angels are praising you and all the people. What about me? I want to bless you, Lord. He's overwhelmed. Psalm 104, 1, 2. It says, bless the Lord, my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with glory and majesty, wrapped in light as with a robe. Think about what it must be like to run cities like New York or London or Tokyo. Eight million people in New York, eight million people in London, 14 million people in Tokyo. Think about it. Complex organizations that administer the water department, the housing department, food supplies, all the essential services. Now think about how infinitely more complex it is for God's responsibility in managing the world in which we live in. There's the problem of supplying water for all creatures. There's an immense logistical task of providing food for men, beasts, birds, and fish. There is the matter of housing and shelter. How could you know this and not fall to your knees at some point in the day? How do we take this for granted? With this in mind, the unnamed psalmist, we don't know who wrote this psalm, he summons every part of him to bless the Lord. It's hard to describe the invisible God or capture his infinite greatness. But the psalmist does a pretty good job here. He's saying God's rolled himself in garments of glory and majesty, splendor, grandeur, his magnificence, his supreme greatness, and wrapped in a robe of light. He's pure and holy and righteous and perfect. Look at Psalm 115. 18, it says, but we will bless the Lord from now on forever. Hallelujah. Here the psalmist argues that as long as we have breath, a.k.a. as long as we are alive, we should bless the Lord. Just for the record, we breathe in and out 22,000 times a day. 22,000 times we take breath. That's 15 breaths a minute. Don't you think every minute you might want to just say one time, bless the Lord? 
It's not asking for too much, is it? Psalm 135, 19, 21. House of Israel, bless the Lord. House of Aaron, bless the Lord. House of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. When you consider the greatness of God, it causes a desire. It's not forced. It's a desire. It's a natural desire to bless Him. You know, a lot of times we say, oh, Rabbi, I want to share something with you. It's a miracle. It's not a miracle to God. It's natural. Everything God does is miraculous. We just don't have a word. We can't grasp it. It's, it's just God being God. We're blown away, but it's like, wow, it's just me doing what I do. You've got to want to shower Him with honor and praise and respect and worship and thanksgiving. He's saying the whole house of Israel should bless Him. All who minister as priests should bless him. Those who serve as Levites should bless him. All who revere God should bless him. In another way, all men. It is within the human DNA to worship. This is why so many today receive worship. Rock stars, athletes, movie stars, they're worshipped. People want to be like them. They want to know everything about them. What do they eat? I don't give a crap what they eat. When they care what I eat, maybe I'll care what they eat. They have nothing to do with me. They could care less about me. And when they put on their little dog and pony show and they feed 50 people on Thanksgiving, I'm not impressed. I'm here to tell you, I can appreciate their talent, but I'd like to see them manage the universe, no less save us all. The best of men are men at best. Don't be a legend in your own mind. Bless the Lord. Psalm 145, 1, 2. I will praise you to the heights, my God, the King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. The theme of this psalm is the greatness of God. The psalmist is consumed with holy determination to bless and praise his God and King in time, every day and in eternity, forever and ever. Why? Look at the next verse, verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is beyond all searching out. The main reason for this endless song is that God is great and He is so worthy of great praise. And it's because of His infinite measure, it's impossible to quantify or capture with intelligible words. In conclusion, I'd like to end our time together the way the King David, who was called a man after God's own heart, ended his time here on earth. You know, It's a pleasure to talk to somebody right before they died because usually they're going to say what's most important. Right before King David died, he'd address the leaders of Israel, his son Solomon, who would take the throne, he was passing the baton, and then he addressed all the people. Some of the greatest words ever said are at the end of somebody's life. And although this was penned 3,000 years ago, it's as if it was written for us today. Look at 1 Chronicles 28.8. David says, Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the community of the Lord, and in the hearing of God, Observe and seek out the commandments of the Lord your God so that you may continue to possess this good land and leave it as an inheritance to your descendants after you. Look, I know some of you were raised very Pentecostal. You can name and claim all day long. If you don't observe his, if you're not obedient to his ways, you're getting nothing. And you know why? Because you deserve nothing. The king reminds the leaders of Israel that blessing is from God and it's attached to obedience to him. This is something that has not changed even with the coming of Jesus the Messiah. His teaching was totally consistent with this principle when he said, if you love me, you'd obey me. Then David goes on to address his son Solomon who will be taking the throne as the new king of Israel. And he says, as for you, Shlomo, my son, know the God of your father. Serve him wholeheartedly and with desire in your being. For the Lord searches all hearts and he understands all the inclinations of people's thoughts. You can't fool him. If you seek him, he'll let himself be found. We lived in the projects, and my father was a big guy, a scary guy, and I was a little boy, and we used to play hide-and-go-seek. And he used to always hide behind the drapes, but he always stuck his feet out so I would find him. Even when you think God's hiding behind the drapes, you can see his feet. He wants to be found. But if you abandon him, he'll reject you forever. The reason why you're teary-eyed is because... I remember when I was on my deathbed and none of the kids could come in. Max was 
only three and Shana was five and I was hooked up to things and it looked so ugly and they wouldn't bring him in. Bernadette wouldn't bring him in. But I said, bring me, bring me Jeremy. And I said, Jeremy, it doesn't look like dad's going to make it. But before I go, I got to know, will you serve the Lord? Do you promise me? I can't go if you don't promise me. I said, dad's not being taken. I'm being received. And I want to see you again, kid. King David leaves his son and his successor Solomon with a promise and a warning. The promise is this, and this is a promise for us. If you seek the Lord, you'll find him. In other words, trust the Lord with all your heart, guys. Consult him in all things. If you do, he'll direct your paths. The warning is if you depart from him, he will reject you. Stick with God. Stick with God. Then he addresses all the people, including all of us who are standing here at BYI today, as well as the thousands that are watching online. And he says in 28, the first part, he says, Then David said to all the community, Now, bless the Lord your God. And what did those people of Israel do? Look at the next verse. All the community blessed the Lord, the God of their ancestors, bowing their heads and prostrating themselves before the Lord and before the king. Guys, listen to your rabbi. Once a day, get on your knees and salute your king. Let's stand together. I love you very much. You don't even know. I tell Bernadette all the time, I love them, Bern. I love them, I love them, I love them, I love them. I only want the best for you. But if I, who fall short on a regular basis, could love you that much, and I really hardly even know you, but you're in my care, can you imagine how much the creator and sustainer of the universe loves you? Don't. Let the enemy tell you different. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. The assembly Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, guys. Love you too.